Thank you. Can I say it's my great honour and privilege to invite a speaker to be the first union leader to address our party, but I'm sure he won't be the last. This city has a radical history. It's a century on from 1922 when the Red Clydesiders were returned, not simply in this city, but across Scotland, with over 200,000 seeing them off, hoping to get change down in London, to deliver a Scottish Parliament, to tackle poverty, and to redistribute income, wealth and power. They sadly got sucked in and closed down, but the tradition lives on, and that tradition is embodied in the RMT, and we are going to hear from the Rail, Maritime and Transport Union. They are, their members have been dealing with many of the challenges facing our society during lockdown. They kept the wheels of our society moving, even at risk to themselves, and yet they now face challenges not just on P&O, but here in Scotland, in ScotRail, and in CalMac, and in other aspects in Walker Life. So it's my great pleasure to invite the regional organiser for RMT, who we should never forget in 2014, were one of the unions that supported YES, actively campaigned, and I know that Gordon Martin was involved in that campaign. So ladies and gentlemen, Gordon Martin. <laughs> Thanks for that welcome, Kenny. I mean, I, I was sitting there thinking there must be a rock star or something coming up to give you a wee song, which we'll be glad to know won't be me. Um, so I'm going to touch on four things very briefly today, four things that are really important and crucial to the way society is governed at this moment in time. So before I do that, I'd like to extend solidarity to this conference for, for myself and the RMT. On a, on a personal level, on a personal level, I was very much in favour of yes in 2014. Spoke at big public meetings all over the country on it, and my position has not changed, unlike some of the leaders of the current Scottish Government, I, I dare say. So, so I, I'm, I'm going to have to speak on something that I didn't intend speaking on, because the bandit capitalists at P&O uh, last Thursday, St. Patrick's Day, uh, made an outright attack, not only on their own staff at P&O, but on the trade union movement and workers' rights right across Britain. Absolute scandal. Not only did they do it, but they went to the House of Commons and said they would do it again. They broke the law, yes, we know we broke the law, yes, that's terrible, yes, but we'll do it again. So that's the kind of people we're up against here. This is the kind of people who are looking to make even more profit. I mean, see all this baloney you hear, you know, they're losing a fortune and all that. Just look at the share dividend they paid out. Look at the share dividend, follow the money. These are bandit capitalists. There's no other way of describing them. And they're a blight on, they're a blight on society and to openly openly admit as the chief executive and director of a company that you broke the law and you would do it again, well, in my view, they should be thrown out, the board should be sacked, the workers should be back in the ships, and the board should be sacked. And if the Tories in Westminster don't have the balls to do it, well, they should be sacked as well. Although, ha having said that, I would sack them anyway, never mind that. So, we... we obviously have to respond to the, to the actions of the bandit capitalists. And I'm delighted to say that across the political spectrum, apart from the Tories, we've had great support. Um, we've had great support for our friends and colleagues in the trade union movement, because everybody knows what's at stake. If they get away with us, who's next? I mean, I had a, a journalist on the radio saying, well, Mr. Martin, surely you understand the, the business model where, you know, they can replace you with, with cheaper workers. I said, well, let's start with you then. Let's start with you. We'll get rid of you and replace you with somebody for cheaper. He didn't like that answer, unfortunately. So in the last few days, including today, actually, in the Port of Liverpool and the Port of Hull, we've had demonstrations against these bandit capitalists. And on Monday, Monday of next week here in uh, Glasgow, no, not that far from here, actually, Govan Road, we'll be targeting Clyde Marine Recruitment 
one of the bandit agencies who were up to their neck in this. They knew that these guys were getting thrown in the scrap heap and they knew they were replacing them with people on far lower wages. So we're going after the supply chain, we're going after P&O, we'll go after everybody because this will be a fight to the finish. And if we lose, or oh, you guys lose as well. Everybody loses if the bandit capitalists win. So thanks for your support so far and I hope to see you. Hope to see you on Monday and then on the 8th of April we're going to get back to Cairn Ryan to blockade the port. Ask the hauliers and others not to cross our line. Because if you cross our line, we lose. And if we lose, everybody loses. So that's what we'll be doing on that. <clears throat> So, so now, now that I've gave you all that, I'll speak about what I was here to speak about. Um, ye yesterday, it's been, a, it's been a busy week. Yesterday we launched in Oban, what we're calling a People's CalMAC. CalMAC to us, we organise CalMAC along with uh, some of the smaller unions. We organise the workforce. And CalMAC is a great national treasure here in Scotland. And if it isn't, it should be. Now, we've... We've came across a thing called Project Neptune, which is a Scottish government inspired instruction to Ernst and Young to go and look at all options available. All options available, including unbundling and privatising CalMAC. Now, the First Minister has stated uh, in Parliament that that isn't their agenda. Well, I, I, I don't know what their agenda is. If it's not on your agenda, don't instruct them to go and look at it. Simple. Well, I'm a simple guy. To me, that's simple. We don't want to privatise it, so that's not on the agenda. Don't look at that. It clearly is on the agenda. So we kick-started yesterday and opened a campaign which we're calling a People's CalMAC. And what that means is CalMAC in public ownership, but with better governance. With islanders on the board and with trade unionists on the board so that the company become reactive to what people need rather than what <laughs> the current board think people need. I mean, people need, we need new tonnage. We've got a couple of boats lying in Ferguson Marine that I think I'll be retired and long gone before they ever see a scrapyard somewhere. Because I, I, don't think, I don't think they're going to ever be on the water, is my honest opinion. But we need new tonnage. Some of the, some of the CalMAC vessels are beyond their working life. You know, they're no fit for purpose. I mean, I heard a wee bit of disable, uh, disability and what have you just as I come in. We have a big percentage of our population disabled. And not just at CalMAC, other ferry companies that don't have the facilities for, for the unfortunate disabled people. So in 2022, going forward, Everybody, every citizen should be looked after. It shouldn't be if you're able-bodied, you're all right. If you're disabled, just sit out there in the rain until we can get somebody to move you. <laughs> totally not on. So we're looking for proper investment. And I know money, they're going to argue the old thing, money's tight, and, right? Money's tight, but it's about political will, isn't it? It's about political will to get new ferries. The islanders are important. The island communities are important. The tourism trade is important. So if we don't provide the services for, first and foremost, the people, and then the tourists, and obviously from our perspective, the workers, they'll go elsewhere. And that'll be another opportunity lost. So that's a people's CalMAC. We'll be pushing on that. As I say, it's a public ownership, but with the right investment and the right people running it. I mean, CalMAC will probably say, I've got too much saying with his own at CalMAC at the moment. But they'll be wrong if they said that. I don't have anywhere near enough. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. The other thing, one of the other things was, you'll all have seen on, on the news just the other week there, it was the, the real accident investigation branch report into the, the carment, the Stonehaven derailment. Now, I, I've been heavily involved in, in you, know, you know, reading the, the report and giving our view on life to RAIB and others. And what I've said to the Scottish Government, what I've said to Mr Hines, the Managing Director of Scotland Railways, and others is, if you cut train services or cut any kind of services, it's an inconvenience. But if you cut rail infrastructure budgets, which they're looking to do, incidentally, do you know what you do? 
You put trains down the embankment. You kill people. That's what you do. So we're pushing very hard on that to ensure that the proper level of investment goes in, continues to go in, to weatherproof the, the railway infrastructure, because anybody that paid even a, a passing glance at the Carmont thing, that's what caused it. Rain. Rain caused a train to go down the embankment, kill three people and injure some of them very badly, six other people. That's what caused it. Rain. I mean, it's Scotland. It rains now and again. So the railway should be able to cope with that. And I, I'm not being flippant here. There was a very significant rainfall that morning in that area. But if it had been weatherproof resilience, the way we are demanding it should be, that probably wouldn't have happened. If the Carillion, talk about bandit capitalists, they're the first one. If they'd been project managed properly by Network Rail in the Stonehaven area rather than in Bishop Briggs, it probably wouldn't have happened in the first instance. But that's another failing. Network Rail at this time, I don't know if he's aware of this, are looking at cutting thousands of jobs all over Britain, frontline maintenance jobs. They're also looking at watering down the safety standards. They'll say they're not, and it's it's engineering management decisions. Absolute baloney. It's rubbish. It's cost-driven. And it's not even the Department for Transport. It's not even Grant Sharps. It's the Treasury that's driving it. Real budget cuts. And as I said at the start on this sector, if you cut real infrastructure budgets, there is only one answer. And it's trains down embankments and people dying. Now, I'm not looking to be sensational or anything like that here. It's a simple fact. It's a simple fact. So we are doing everything we can with the Scottish Government, with Network Rail at a national level and in a Scottish level and Transport Scotland to say, you can't cut these jobs, you can't cut the investment, because if you do, you put trains down the embankment, you kill people. The other thing is ScotRail, as you know from Friday, I think it is, ScotRail will be run by Nicola Sturgeon. And this is the same Nicola Sturgeon that said during the DOO dispute, this is only a dispute about who pushes buttons. She pushed her buttons that day, by the way, I'll tell you that. Absolutely pushed her buttons. It just shows the ignorance of some of these so-called leaders when they can say things like that. DOO, driver-only operation, is all about safety as well. But these people, that, that you know, they know the price of everything, the value of nothing, really. And they try and tell us, the experts, what, what's safe. Very good. So from Friday, ScotRail will be wholly under the remit of the Scottish Government. We welcome that, of course we do. Public ownership. But public ownership without investment. You know what that you know what they used to call that? British Rail. <laughs> that's what they, that's British. See, see if British Rail had got the same level of investment as all these profiteers have had since British Rail was was privatised, it would have been the envy of the world. But it didn't get that. It would get starved of investment. It gets starved of everything. You know, they cut the workforce right to the bone and then they privatised it. And then they put money into it. Not, not for our guys, but for the, for the shareholders. You know, as I say, the, the P&O and the DP world, that this was not about a loss-making operation. Just look at the share dividends. Follow the money. Follow the money. So when they say they can't afford something, say, well, what was the share dividend? What did your shareholders get paid? And that gives you the answer where, where it goes with the money. So at, at the moment, we're looking for, and that, this is bizarre, public ownership. We're looking for a commitment to no compulsory redundancies at ScotRail. We've got it with Abelio today, but as of Friday, when Nicola Sturgeon and Co. take over, we haven't got that commitment yet. I'm fairly sure we'll get it, but we haven't got it yet. So there's uncertainty for our members less than a week to go to being run by the Scottish Government. We've also not got any commitment that they're not going to cut stations, no closed stations, so you go to a station. Again, it's about safety. Everything we do is about safety. If you go to a station late at night or any time and you've got undesirables hanging about, Tory MPs, MP MSPs, something like that, and you're yourself, and you're vulnerable, whether it's through disability or, or any reason, you're vulnerable, you're yourself, whereas at the moment, if there's somebody there, 
at least we can phone the cops. Might never come, but at least we can phone them. You know, maybe, 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 they'll, maybe they'll maybe be with the Tory MPs saying, this is terrible, all these demonstrations. Let, let this poor DP world sack these people. They'll maybe be with them. Because I know on Monday, just as we had at Cairn Ryan earlier in the week, I know on Monday we're going to have the, the, the police all over us saying that you can't do this. Sorry, Mr. Martin, you can't protest here. So these people in there can sack or be complicit in the sacking of 800 workers, but I can't go outside their office and tell them they're a shower of bastards. <laughs> Guess what? Guess what? I'll be there. I'll be there with a megaphone telling them they're a shower of bastards. And by the way, that's not a swear word, because it's the only word that really describes them without getting into swear words. So that, that's, that's some of the, the trials and tribulations of the RMT at the moment. But I'll tell you what, we're not going anywhere, because see, even before all this COVID stuff, Boris Johnson was deliberately tailoring employment law against workers. But I'll tell you what group of workers it was really against, ours. It was really about ours, about hamstringing us, making industrial action ineffective. So many percent of your, your members must be there to provide a service. Now, what kind of industrial relations framework does that leave you? Well, the boss holds all the aces, and even when you jump through all the hurdles, I mean, people think, you know, strike action, workers stick the horn up and go out the door. It takes weeks. You need to give them two weeks' notice before you do it. You know, it takes weeks. So for workers being irate enough to lose wages through withdrawing their labour, to actually withdrawing their labour, takes weeks. Didn't it take P&O weeks? They just decided. it. Andy Good, and I'll tell you something about Andy Good. Sorry, I'm going about your rant here. None of this is wrote down. <laughs> Andy Good, see the guy that sacked all these people? Andy Good was at Kilmac. I don't know if you know that. During the, 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 the last phrase of the, the Chiefs contract, Andy Good was brought in by Transport Scotland as an employment relations expert. <laughs> I says, you don't need one of them, I'll do that. Get him out of here. And that is, that is true. I told a government minister at the time that if they didn't get this guy out of Calmac, we were going to be at perpetual war. He was there to destroy. The, we, we had a good working relationship with Calmac. He was there to destroy it. He was there to destroy the workforce. And really, that would have been the start of a real privatisation agenda at Calmac. So these people float about being a bam pot here, a bam pot there, a bam pot everywhere. You know, you know the old song about them. So that's where we are. Um, I thank you again. I mean, I had a, a good conversation with, with some of the top table here before I come in. We probably went on too long, Alex, since I wish he would shut up. So I'm going to shut up on this. I've been made to feel very welcome here. And uh, if you invite us back, I'm sure we'll come back. Um, but, that, that MT. The RMT don't affiliate to any political party, but what we do is we try and influence people, uh, some more successfully than others, some a bit more gently than others, and people that can work with us, and I've done some work with Kenny on some stuff recently, and I'm sure that will continue, in fact, I'm hoping it will continue on a wider scale, because we do really need to work together. We want a decent society. I'm sure everybody in here Maybe not everybody's a socialist. I'm a socialist. Don't hide it from me. I'm sure not everybody in here will be. But what we need is a decent society. We need to hand over better to our kids and grandkids than we inherited. You see, if we don't, we've failed. And I don't want to be a failure. I've failed at a lot of things. I don't want that to be one. I want to pass on better to my kids and hopefully live long enough to have grandkids as well. Because if we don't, that's a failure. So we need to work together to do that. The old National Union of Seafarers was pulled together the same. We need to pull together to work for a better society because we've got real opponents there in Westminster. We've seen it this week. Not that we needed to see it this week. We see it every week with the buggers. But we've seen it more clearly this week whose side they're on. And I'll tell you what, it's not the end here. So we need to work together for the betterment of society the betterment of Scotland, since we are here talking an independent support party. 
And I wish you all the best, any candidates, and I'm sure there are a few uh, in this room. I wish you all the best for your election campaign and get some radical voices into some of the councils, you know, because, you know, we, when, when councils set their budgets, I, I, live, I live in North Lanarkshire, and every year when the Trades Council would, would say, this is terrible, you know, they're setting the budget and it's cut, cut, cut. Let's have a protest outside. My answer was always, let's kick the door in and tell them they work for us. Thank you.